In October, we broke ground in uh, Marshall Peacock's Health and Human Service uh, Center. And for the first time, for the first time, Milwaukee County will have a building designed specifically for health and human services. This is gonna to help to eliminate many of the physical barriers, especially if you have been through that Cox building, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because if, if you have some type of physical disability, if you are coming in a wheelchair, it is hard to navigate that. So we wanna make sure that there's ease of access uh, to our services. We also opened up in 2022, our Mental Health Emergency Center. And we intentionally moved the Mental Health Center from the Wauwatosa area uh, to uh, the, the, the King Park neighborhood. And this was intentional because majority of the people that we work with, that we were providing services for in that Wauwatosa area, 70% either live in or around the King Park neighborhood. And so if we wanna ease that access, if we wanna create even more efficiencies, moving this center was extremely important. But moving this center also allowed us to really take care of folks and really give folks the, the assistance that they needed. Within this first full year, we were able uh, to see, to serve more than 7,000 individuals that were experiencing mental health or substance use disorder related crisis. And since last August, we have placed 11 different harm reduction vending machines in key locations throughout the county. And this is a tool to really combat uh, the opioid crisis, the overdose deaths, and the access to guns that we see. Because what we combine in these machines are our harm and, and prevention supplies, harm reduction and prevention supplies. So when we're talking about, what we're talking about is fentanyl testing strips, right? We're talking about nasal naloxone. We're talking about medication deactivation pouches and medication lock bags, as well as gun locks. This is almost a safety vending machine. It's free to the public. And in just the first five months, the public has nearly, has used nearly 2,500 fentanyl testing strips, over 2,100 uh, doses of Narcan and over 1,200 gun lots from these vending machines. So we know that they are working, and I just want folks to know that we're also looking to place more vending machines uh, in the community. And so right now, we're looking to expand uh, about uh, eight more vending machines about around the county. So if you or someone that you know, organizations in, 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 in particular areas that know that these, these life-saving devices will be helpful, please let us know they can apply uh, with our Department of Health and Human Services. Now, our shared vision for Milwaukee County also includes expanding equitable access to safe, quality, and affordable housing. And I know firsthand the effects that housing instability can have on one growing up. You know, I've, I've been evicted. I have moved numerous of times within a short uh, span of my life, a lifetime. And I know that without having a roof over your head, it's hard to focus on your own health. It's hard to focus on how to put food on the table. It's hard to focus on getting to the doctor and just taking care of your physical and mental health. And so Milwaukee County's Department of Health and Human Services received, received about $2 million uh, in grants to expand our homeless prevention as well as our intervention services. And we have also expanded our homeless outreach team uh, to significantly decrease the time that individuals are experiencing unsheltered homelessness. Now I will say that we have been able to make great strides within Milwaukee County. For the past two years, we have been able to say that we've been able to be recognized as having the lowest unsheltered homeless count per capita of any community our size. But while we can hang our hat on that, we know that we still have a long road ahead of us. We know that our homeless population is, is, is increasing steadily, but we just know that we have to focus on this issue. This isn't a Milwaukee County problem. This isn't a Wisconsin problem. This is a problem that we're having all across the community. But that's also one of the reasons why, working with uh, our county board uh, members, we allocated $15 million in ARPA funds for, uh, for affordable housing developments. But particularly what's great about this is that these are investments that are happening in suburban communities, in five different suburban communities all across Milwaukee County. And they've generated uh, at least 38 units for our seniors and then 80 units for people with disabilities. And we're now wrapping up construction on 120, 120 new single family homes in the King Park neighborhood. So renters can actually become homeowners, creating housing stability and generational wealth for all of our residents. Now, in order to truly have a healthy community, our residents and our families must have places where they can go have fun, where they can have that recreation. 
but also go to a place where they can also exercise and have some space for some relaxation. And this is not just about physical health, because I believe that our parks provide something for our mental health as well. And so throughout the past few decades, the Morgan County Park staff have been forced, they've been forced to find creative solutions to keep our parks beautiful with fewer and fewer resources. And even with the limited resources, our team at the Milwaukee County Parks, they've completed 16 capital projects uh, just last year and planted over 360 new trees. And because of our budget surplus in 2024, I'm proud to share that with you that we will be investing over $23 million in our parks projects, and we created an opportunity to create 18 new full-time positions to support both operations and maintenance and other things. So yeah, for Thank you. Uh, but we also affirm Milwaukee County's uh, dignity, dignity and value for older adults in all of our communities. And before I get started, I just have to give a, a quick shout out uh, to our chairwoman. I know she's here today, uh, Jan, Wil Jan, Jan Wilberg. Uh, for our Commission on Aging. Our Commission on Aging has been doing great work in this community. They oversee a lot of the different programs. And, and I know that there was some, some angst related to the consolidations of our Commission on Aging within the Department of Health and Human Services. But what I will tell you is that this has allowed us to actually strengthen some of our programs. But more importantly, I think for the first time in a long time, we've actually increased the budget for our Commission on Aging. So I wanna make sure that I say thank you uh, to all of our commissioners. But the population of our older adults, I think all of us know that it is constantly growing. And so we will have the most diverse group of aging of our aging residents uh, that our region has ever seen. So during my term as county executive, I worked to support the needs of our aging residents by providing tax levy funds to support aging services, which helps fund senior center, uh, senior center programming, nutrition programs, and elder abuse prevention. We also continue to engage partnerships that enact our vision of race and health equity while finding innovative, uh, innovative ways to deliver critical services. And this includes the award-winning Dying Out program that we have with local minority-owned businesses. And I'm also proud of our entire systems move from institutional care uh, to home and community-based services. And this is going to be a great benefit for the vast majority of our older adults particularly as it relates to easily access to critical services. But I also want to say that our Commission on Aging has continuously been pushing for the, how we reimagine our senior centers as well, which is going to be critical uh, moving forward. But we know that we have more work to do. We have more work to do when it comes down to supporting, particularly our family caregivers, to improve the access and the resources that they have throughout their entire lifespan and continue to support our older residents and older adults and help them age gracefully and with dignity. Older adults are our trusted and most, of, uh, and most importantly for me, important voices that, rely, that I rely on, particularly for counsel as well as insight. And so that's why I wanna hear from you all today. I just wanna say thank you for this opportunity. So please tell me what your issues are and more importantly, how we can work together to move this community forward. But I'm also uh, welcoming any questions that you may have. So I wanna say thank you for this opportunity uh, and I'm on the hot seat. Would you be willing to explore a metro approach by combining city and county services for public safety and public health? Uh, great question. So I will tell you that we, the city and I, the county, uh, we've been in some discussions right now. We actually just had a report that came out a couple weeks ago from the Wisconsin Policy Forum to actually look at uh, some things that we could be doing back back office consolidations to see what kind of efficiencies that we can create. Uh, we know that we've seen this already happening across Milwaukee County when you think about the North Shore and how they've consolidated uh, their, their, their fire department and their, and their 911 calls. Some communities on the, on the south side of Milwaukee County also have consolidated programs like with the public health departments, fire departments, so on and so forth. I will say that as we begin to have these conversations, we also need to make sure that we can have them countywide. We need all local municipalities to be at the table when it comes down to finding more efficiencies. So as it relates to having a, a, a huge metro Milwaukee County government, I'm not sure if, we can, if that's palatable right now politically across Milwaukee County. But I will tell you is that we are having those conversations. Uh, and I would say if you feel that we need to have these conversations even more, 
uh, the best avenue, the best vehicle to really bring the questions to is the uh, ICC, which is the uh, Intergovernmental Co uh, Cooperation Council uh, between all local municipalities. So we have all 19 municipalities represented, and it also includes the county board chairwoman and myself. Are we going to increase pressure on the state to increase state revenue to local government? Oh, that's an easy question. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But it's not just putting pressure on, 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 our, on, our, on our state partners. It's also about putting pressure on our federal partners as well. There are dollars at both the state, federal, and I will also argue the philanthropic level that we could be taking advantage of. And it is our goal to do that. We need to be leveraging these partnerships and bringing as many resources back to Milwaukee County. So I should bring the chair. It's really fun. Why not? Who should I contact for state term care or uh, uh, short term short term care, three to four uh, for in home care for seniors? Did I get that clear? Okay. And what what where are the adult uh, daycare centers? The adult daycare centers. So. Uh, that I would have to give to you. So we don't operate directly those daycares, those those centers, right? So we could do a lot of contracting, and a lot. Some of this could be also state functions. But I can get you in touch with 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 our aging services to make sure that you get that information. Thank you. You're welcome. Please add education to the discussion. Everybody knows that we need to focus on education. Um, I would say that you know Milwaukee County we're very unique, right? Because we represent many different uh, districts within Milwaukee County, uh, with NPS being the largest one. And I would tell you that uh, the, the superintendent of NPS and I, we do have regular meetings. We meet up, uh, at least every two months to really have some discussions. And more importantly, it's really about how do we utilize our programs and our services to really support those students and those families. Um, you know, there's, there's still some, some legislation out there hover, hovering over, over us at the county level. So for example, uh, there's still a, a, a legislation out there that gives Milwaukee County the ability uh, to take over five schools uh, within MPS. I'll be the first one to tell you we are not going to be doing that at all uh, because we know I, I truly believe as an MPS graduate, our school board directors and our superintendent uh, have a handle on what, needs, what the need is for our children. Uh, but we do need to create even more partnerships when it comes down to our children and making sure that the pathway for them creates even more opportunities. We are hiring for change makers every day at Milwaukee County. And I look at our pool as, as individuals who live in Milwaukee County. So we're gonna to continue to work with our school system to make sure that we can create that pipeline of workers for whatever industry they wanna go into. I think part of that was public education on that because that was mine. And the data, you know me well, and I think that the state emphasis has been on privatization and getting money to the non-public schools and my conver my conversation with you and others is how do we put the emphasis back on public education well i will tell you that i mean honestly it's really a, we have to we have to step outside our geographical comfort zone and it's really about building relationships with other communities across this state because they see how the privatization of our k-12 schools has actually decimated public the public system in general and so you know i see the writing on the wall as, as they begin to to invest in, in even more private schools. And it's not to say that private schools can't do good, right? But as they invest in more private schools, we're actually eliminating a level of accountability, yeah. right? We're eliminating. And so if we see more privatization of, of, of going up, that means we see the dwindling of public schools, their level of accountability start to dwindle. And then some of, for some of our most vulnerable students, those who may have mental or physical disabilities, what happens with those folks, right? And so we have to, we seriously have to and it is my hope, uh, especially with the changing of the maps, and the all of us is looking to get that. I see Fred Kessinger is here. Uh, 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 that's going to really provide. That's going to really provide an opportunity for us to make incredible investments in public education. That's great. You mentioned that finances are good for the next few like, years. What happens in year three? Do we have a need when tax increase? Yeah, I like my job, so I'm not sure if I want to do another tax increase. Um, but but, but what it, it, it's really about strengthening that partnership. We know that there are things that we can still identify, and not just with more money, but even through policy 
uh, that we can see some release valves through the state of Wisconsin that would put Milwaukee County in a better fiscal or financial situation. And so just to give some clarity, right, when we talk about this budget, and I, I see uh, a possible new comptroller in the back, Liz Sumner here, County Board Supervisor, Chair of our Finance Committee. This was extremely no thing as far as it develops. Um, we know that we have to tighten our belts. We know that we have to look at things, but what's, more, what's most important to me, and I would say also uh, to the county board, is making sure that we can continue to make these incredible investments in the programs and services. We don't want to see our quality, uh, our quality programs and services dwindle at all. So we want to keep them going. And so to put it in perspective, what this local option sales tax really did is it, it, tremendous, it reduced our debt tremendously. So come 2028, we would have been facing a hundred million dollar deficit within Milwaukee County. Now come 2028, we're only facing a $30 million deficit, right? <laughs> but, but, but this is the conversation that we go back to, right? Because our shared revenue wasn't increased like everyone else, right? We had a, we got a 14% increase, but we see in communities, you've got a 600%, 50% increase. We know that there's still a fight that we need to bring to the table. And I truly believe that this is where the partnerships come in at. You know, it's hard to go across the state, and I, and I think Representative Kessler would, would understand this, hard to go across the state talking about being the economic engine of the state and other communities without feeling like you're beating on your chest. But we do this in partnership with, right? How, do we, how are we doing this in keeping, you know, when we did a tapping of the golden, a golden keg and landing Cooper, that was a great thing to do, right? It was a fun experience. But what they did not understand is, okay, if Milwaukee goes down and Morrison Coors goes down, what's the ripple effect to Line and Kugel, right? When you think about the companies that we have here and who we contract with in other places across this state, if companies leave here, if businesses decide to leave here, there's only a ripple effect that's going to happen all across this state. And so we have to create these partnerships and really talk about how, yes, we are the economic engine of the state, but we do this in partnership. Yes. We know a lot of our money is going to the state and we subsidize other communities. And it's not to say that we shouldn't be playing a role in being a partner with other communities. But we also need to we also need to stand up for ourselves and making sure that the resources that we're actually providing to the state are coming down and we're distributing it equitably across the state of Wisconsin, because that is the biggest problem. That is the biggest problem. Amen. Amen. <laughs> How can citizens best make their needs known? And how can we help you make good happen? <laughs> Even when all. Um, one, but it's friends. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is a good room, right? Like, um, so one, like, you know, signing up for our newsletters. Many of you are probably, you, you probably get the Crowley Connect. Um, and, and, and honestly, this has been wildly successful for our office because, the, you know, for many folks, the first time that they have been able to get real information in real time about what's happening at the county and more importantly everybody gets to see what their county executive is doing um but to help us right this is really about understanding that the work that we're embarking on as a county we cannot do alone we need partnerships we need everyone at the table letting their voice be heard and, and the way that you can be uh, uh, helpful is not only just engaging uh, your county board supervisors but it's also engaging those local municipalities, not just here within the city of Milwaukee, but when I think about Shorewood, when I think about Fox Club, when I think about Oak Creek, when I think about South Milwaukee, making sure that, and that we have to remember that Milwaukee County has never been, has it always been seen in the greatest light, right? And so there's a lot of PTSD between, between relationships. And so one, we have to repair those relationships, but we also need your assistance when it comes down to advocating for the resources, the programs, or the services that you, your neighbors need to the state, because we have to make sure that our state representatives are bringing this uh, 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 this voice to the to, uh, to, to the state as well. But more importantly, we have some very important elections going. On. You know, when you think about not not just this spring, me on the ballot, uh, but more importantly, when I think about what is happening this fall statewide and across this country, yes. we have to make sure that we get out the vote. You know, knocking on as many doors as possible, and I know that there is a lot of voter fatigue, political fatigue. Uh, uh, some candidate fatigue, but we have to go out there and really stress the importance of letting folks, let, uh, uh, letting folks' voice be heard within that ballot box. This is an extremely critical time for the state of Wisconsin, but particularly for Milwaukee, because the more that we show up, the more we can tilt the scales 
in the direction that we want to go. Mm -hmm. yep. My pile of questions is finished. Um, no, so to what? Oh, look at that, the <laughs> magic. No, I want to hear. Could you please talk about the urban underground? Uh, too, too little is known about it. Absolutely. So, uh, I, I, uh, urban underground is near and dear to me. I actually had an opportunity to sit on a panel with my my mentor Reggie Moore, who, who was the co-founder of Urban Underground and literally saved my life. So, Urban Underground was a youth uh, development organization that was created in the year two two thousand. Uh, and and with the, the point of Urban Underground was really to take young people out of their neighborhoods and get them involved and introduce them to community organizing. Um, I got involved when I was a junior in high school, and the first uh, issue that I actually worked on was teen domestic violence. A young woman was killed at Tech High School uh, by her boyfriend because she wouldn't wear his, his promise ring. And we started doing organizing around that, and, and it really, and, it, and, it, and I learned that not only did I like this work, that I was actually pretty good at the work. Um, and so I continue to do organizing and Urban Underground really introduced me uh, to things that I, I never would have seen before. It brought me out of my neighborhood, it brought me out of this community to learn about different things that was happening in a Washington DC or in New York or in Atlanta. And, and, and what they did was is that they really instilled in us not only how to love ourselves, but how to love our community and how to give back to this community. And in Urban Underground, They've produced about four different state representatives. Uh, they've produced a county executive. Uh, they produce some order persons also within the city of Milwaukee. So it's a great organization that I we heard said, huh? The mayor too. Mayor, with the, he was black achievers. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. He was one of the black achievers. Uh, <laughs> uh, so with the mayor and I, we went to high school together. So I was a year ahead of the mayor. Um, he knew he was going to run for office back then, and that's somewhat for myself. Um, but but Urban Underground, literally, it was this you know youth-led organization that really focused on doing organizing. And once I was a member, I actually started working there uh, via AmeriCorps as a public ally, and I was a community justice coordinator. And you know, as a community justice coordinator, I actually worked on uh, criminal justice issues. I created a books not bars program where we're teaching young people with their rights and responsibilities were if they were pulled over or encountered law enforcement. And this was in conjunction uh, with the uh, ACLU as well, the reason I got to meet Danell as well. Um, but uh, Urban Underground, I would not be standing in, in, in front of any of you all if it wasn't for this organization. They've literally introduced me uh, to, 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 to every mentor, to every adult who has literally poured into me to be who I am today. What can be done to resurrect the idea of a regional transit authority? Whew. Um, yeah. Uh, actually, you know, we, you know, when 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 the ninth wonder was coming to Wisconsin, Foxconn. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 you know, one of the things that I fought for because it was the ninth wonder coming to Wisconsin was that. You know, if, if we're expecting this type of level of growth, which we know we haven't seen, we needed to have a regional transit authority. You know, if we're gonna be talking about moving that amount of people, we need a regional transit authority. And I would argue that um, the changing of the maps gives us this opportunity to be quite frank with you. Um, you know, for me, we need an RTA. If we want to be able to say, not just walk county transit, but you think about Walkershire, you think about Racine, you think about just Southeast of Wisconsin, we need a regional transit authority. And it doesn't just affect us as well, because I believe the Wausau and Chippewa Falls area would like to see an RTA happening in their communities. But it's, I would say that it's not even, it's not really a partisan issue because there are Republicans actually in the state legislature who actually believe in a regional transit authority. It's the leadership uh, within, within certain aspects of um, politics that does, does, does not want to, to allow this to happen. And so what I would say is that we just have to continue to have these conversations, right? Like, we have to we have to modernize our, our transportation systems. I want to see more electric buses. I want to see more BRTs. But we're going to have to get our counties having some conversations. And I would argue that while we may not be able to create a regional transit authority, which would be great in bringing resources back, it doesn't stop myself being able to develop a relationship with a Corey Mason and Racine to figure out how we get our transportation systems talking. It doesn't stop myself from working with Immobilize 
or with the, uh, with Waukesha, city of Waukesha, when it comes down to transit. So those are some of the things that we have been doing. One of the reasons why we have a fare box to whether you're in Waukesha or Milwaukee's, that was go past going to work. So we're going to continue to have those conversations. But I would say is that we need more people in position at the state level to really make it happen. Somebody has asked for uh, your thoughts about public housing in suburbs. We need it. <laughs> you know, um, we, you know, it, it's, it's ironic. Uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you know, we, we, we've been hearing the NIMBY conversation has been going on for so long. Uh, but uh, many of that has been changed. When I think about the partnerships that we created with Wauwatosa, partnerships that we created with Brown Deer, many of you probably read in the paper of what we were trying to do in the, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, was it Glendale or Whitefish, Whitefish, Bay, Whitefish Bay area, uh, which we're still going to continue to push. But we still, we're going to have affordable housing actually happening in, in South Milwaukee right now. So suburban communities are open to the idea, but we still have an issue when it goes down to you know, issues with zoning that eliminate the possibility of creating more density in some of these neighborhoods. But when it comes down to affordable housing, when it comes down to public housing, people have to understand that we're not just talking about poor people, right? We're not talking, we're talking about working class folks who work in some of these communities, but unfortunately don't make enough to actually afford a, an apartment or afford to own their own homes in these communities. But we also need to make sure that we're diversifying our incomes across Milwaukee County. I can't, I can't see a young person living on 10 and bird lie to inspire to be a civic engineer if he's never seen them before, right? And so we have, to, we have to become more innovative and creative as far as we're replacing a lot of our affordable housing options. But more importantly, we have to make sure that they're spread out across Milwaukee County and not concentrated only within the city of Milwaukee. David, I grew up on 10th and bird lie. <laughs> Yes, where, the engineer. <laughs> <laughs> where do we find the next group of David Crowley's? That's a great question. And I will tell you that the next group of David Crowley's you interact with every day. Um, so yesterday I had the opportunity um, to, to, to share the stage with, with Pastor Ken Locke from Evolve Church with my mentor, Reggie Moore. And it was a, a, a mentor Greater Milwaukee conversation. It was an opportunity for really to, for me and Reyes to kind of give flowers to one another and, and talk about uh, the, the journey. And the reason why I say that you meet David Crawley's on an everyday basis is because I am not the person that somebody said was going to run for office. I was that knucklehead who still kept his pants pulled up, you know, um, not all the time. And the other family. Um, said, you know, my, my, my mother, before she passed, she used to love telling the story that the day that I decided to pull my pants up was when I was walking down the street and two elderly women was on the same side of the street as me. And when they seen me, the first thing they did was they crossed the street. And since that day, I, was, I stopped sagging my pants. I had to be about 16, 17 years old. But really what it is, is about really giving young people more responsibility and a level of accountability. They have to know that we are there for them and we're there to support them in whatever capacity that they're in. And a lot of the times it may just be that knucklehead on the block. And what they're actually expressing is the, the level of leadership that they actually had. And so sometimes it's really about how do we step outside of our comfort zones and really pull young people in and have conversations about their potential. Because if it wasn't for the people who were around me who seen the power and potential within me, I would have never found ways to pull it out of myself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming to clean up Lincoln Park and for leading park walks for a healthy community. You're welcome. I, I listen, I believe the parks are the, the beating drum of Milwaukee County, the crown jewels of what we have, because I don't think you can go anywhere in this country of community our size and have the level of access uh, to park and green spaces that you have. And so we, we, we need to embrace our park spaces. We need to activate our park spaces so they can become safer places. But this is a refuge, I truly believe, for our mental and physical health. And, and I think we've learned that, particularly after, uh, since this pandemic, about how much our parks really mean to us. Uh, climate resilience. Milwaukee County owns open space and farmland that is not zoned as parks. Will you pledge to not let the county sell off these 
unprotected lands that are crucial to local agriculture and climate resilience. Actually, those lands are parkland. So they're not, they're not, they're not labeled as parks, but they were, they are labeled as parkland. So prior uh, to me becoming county executive, the county board actually transferred uh, many of our lands uh, to be deemed as parkland. And a lot of that was to make sure that, um, and y'all probably understand the tension that was going on between the board and my, and my predecessor, but it was to make sure that uh, no county executive would be able to actually sell any land uh, without the approval of the county board. Uh, what can we do to stop uh, landowners from increasing rents? You know, Milwaukee County, we, we've been trying to be a leader in this, right? Like we tried, you know, we passed ordinances in the past to eliminate discrimination, even with like housing vouchers and things of that nature. But unfortunately, the state, the state has really preempted local control on this. And so local municipalities, we don't have there's nothing that we can do other than using our positions as a bully pulpit to really talk about this issue. But I will tell you that so a lot of the issue is, is that we have, you know, particularly in, you know, oh, is this a C4, C3? I don't know like how I could talk. Um, but, <laughs> but we have Republican leaders who are landlords themselves who don't want to see things happen in this state. And so with the change of maps, with, with, with your help, with your voices, we can make things happen in the next couple of years when it comes down to housing. Because a lot of this is really about getting the state to put forth policies that, 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 that give us the ability uh, locally to put some things in place. When it comes down to our mental health services, we're still providing the same level of services that we were providing for. We're actually what we wanted to do was stop institutionalizing individuals and give them as much community-based so, uh, uh, community support as possible. Because institutionalizing individuals does not do the work that we needed to do. If we're able to find individuals' homes, right? So we believe in a housing first model. So we have housing navigators that are out every day. And even throughout this cold and this, the snow, we're out there consistently. We even had our, our, our Milwaukee County Transit Service uh, uh, buses actually transporting people from places where they were losing power, losing heat to make sure that they were out in any type of cold weather. So we are constantly out there every single day. But let's, let's also put in perspective that we're also talking about the combination of both, not just homelessness, but also mental health. And so some of the issues that we have is that individuals who are experiencing a mental health crisis who may be homeless, they sometimes refuse our services. They refuse our services. And I will tell you that our goal within our housing first uh, navigation as well as through our mental health professionals is we have to continue to work at that. We have to continue to build those relationships. You know, within my second year of being county executive, we told the story about a guy. It took us a year to develop the relationship with the guy. We finally helped him find housing. He filed some employment, and he's doing much better than he was prior to that. But we're then, but this is when I say that it's not just going to be us. People don't trust us a lot of the times. So we are still from there, right? right? We need folks to really talk about the programs and services that we provide. Let folks know that we're there to support them. But there's only so much that we can do when people literally refuse our help out on these streets. And I can say that because I've personally been out there on ride-alongs and in different tents, uh, tent cities throughout the city of Milwaukee and Milwaukee County. And many individuals, when you, knock, when, you, when, when you let them know that you're outside their tent, and you let them know what services are available to them, many of them don't even want you to see their face. They don't even want to come out. They're okay where they are. But we have to continue. Just like you eat a whole elephant, we got to continue to take one bite at a time, one step at a time to really reach these individuals. Well, I worked in the mental health complex, so that, and I would have patients come in and refusals were very common. I guess my comment is a huge portion of the budget is already set aside, right? Correct. On this, so that would be so there's a, so, you know, if I'm mistaken, I think Sandy Paz, which was a state representative, did some, some mental health reform for Milwaukee County. And one of the things that it did was set a floor. It is a floor of what we actually put into mental health. So if I think that floor is about $56 million. And it's not to say 
then we will put more. We actually need to be putting more, but that's also the issue that we have is that we need to be advocating for more mental health resources from both the state and federal level. And so what's, what's unique this time around, particularly with the Mental Health Emergency Center, is that we actually have a partnership with all of the, uh, the four healthcare systems within Milwaukee County. It's a very unique partnership that we have. We have Ascension, we have Advocate of World, we have Children's Hospital, and we have, uh, hold on, blanking. Is it Freighter? Uh, maybe, I think Freighter. Um, and so uh, they actually have a cost sharing system with us. So all of those healthcare systems now actually give dollars towards that mental health emergency center. And, and one of the reasons that is is because they know that we have the capacity to an extent to actually deal with these particular types of patients, whether they don't have the capacity to deal with these types of patients in the emergency world. So we have probably a first of its kind of cost sharing agreement with our healthcare systems when it comes down to family mental health services. That you'll be the last question. Thank you. You said that. I'm kidding. Oh, you do? Okay. I wanted to um, also say I understood what you're saying about mental health. I was a disability navigator for 20 years. And the other agencies that do work with people with mental health are Goodwill, DVR, Independence First, you know, all of those because we all work together. But I wanted to thank you for the parks because you made parks accessible with youth with disabilities and that was just so awesome for me, having worked with those kids and going places that they could go, you know, if they had a wheelchair or if they were on crutches or whatever. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. And before I go, you know, we, we're doing what we can, not only to just tell our story, right, as far as all the great things that we've been doing within Milwaukee County, we're also leading the way as far as advocating on behalf of counties. So this year, I'm the chair of the Large Urban Counties Caucus with, with the National Association of Counties, and, but I'm also I'm also a board of director, but I'm also on the uh, National Mental Health Task Force that has been created in conjunction with the White House to figure out what more we can do as it relates to mental health. The mental health issue, the mental health crisis that we're seeing in this community is happening all across the country, and no one has the resources uh, to, to, to really handle these issues. And but one of the things that we are learning is, is that affordable housing is also connected with this, right? You can't, you can't talk about, uh, you can't talk about workforce without talking about transportation. You can't talk about mental health without also talking about housing now. And so we're, we have to find ways to really couple these, these, these issues together, not only to tackle these issues and to really put us on a better path to prosperity, but to really bring resources back, this is the only way that we're going to be able to not only leverage the bodies as far as the workers that we have, but the resources that we have to really get something done. Beautiful.